Hi all, Dave here again. So here we are with another questions for atheist style video. Like I said in the one I did answering Michael Brown's questions, you'll probably find me doing a few of these for a little while at least. I'm going to try to pick ones that offer something a little different, but they do make for easy content and I kind of need that at the moment just to build up videos. And it's content that allows me to express some of my ideas about God in a nice easy way. They also seem to be pretty popular in the atheist and skeptic community. Not that I could ever see me being particularly popular in the atheist and skeptic community. I've had this one sitting in a playlist for quite a while now. It first appeared back in October last year. One of the reasons I was drawn to it was because the questions were slightly different to the norm as you'll probably notice as we go along. It's also a list of questions from a Mormon, which is something I don't really see a lot. Most of these questions for atheist style videos seem to come from Christians and Muslims. But that's enough of an introduction, let's get on with question one. If you came face to face with God, would you still deny him? So, what we have on screen here at the moment is Mormons chapter 9, verse 2 and 3. Rather than just answering the basic question asked, I'll also respond to something in the text. To answer the basic question, of course I wouldn't deny him. At least if what is meant here by deny him is to deny the fact that God exists. If this great day mentioned in the verse was to come about, and I was then brought in front of Jesus, or God, then it would be completely irrational for me to deny him. Any skeptic that would deny that God exists when presented with such empirical evidence would not be a particularly good skeptic, as this would be pretty undeniable evidence. The question asked by the saint's theory is basically covered by the first verse shown here. There are a couple of others asked in the other verse though. The most important one is the final question. It asks whether I could be happy living with God when my soul is racked with guilt with the knowledge that I have abused his laws. Which has a pretty simple answer really. My answer would be, sure, of course I would be happy. The reason I would be happy is that I simply wouldn't be racked with guilt for abusing his laws. As far as I can see, I have good reasons for not abiding by many of his laws as they are presented to me. Following some of those laws would actually make me feel guilty and go against my conscience. So rather than be racked with guilt for not following them, I would still feel as if I had done the right thing in the here and now. Which means I would have no problem dwelling with God knowing that I had abused his laws. What would you ask God if you saw him? In all honesty, I'm not really sure. It's not something I particularly think about. There are all kinds of standard questions like, why do you allow people to preach hatred in your name? Or, why did you create a world that relied on the death and suffering of so many species in order for the world to progress? And that kind of thing. My question would probably be a little different though. Assuming that God isn't akin to some kind of trickster djinn like in the Wishmaster films, I think it would probably be something like, can you put all the answers to the questions I have about you into my mind please? That way I would only have to ask one question to have all the answers I need. Would it be reasonable to say that all things denote there is a God? What's on screen now is the verse that's quoted in the question. There doesn't seem to be anything extra in the verse that needs to be answered. From what I can see, it simply boils down to a case of why are you asking for signs from God when all things point to there being a supreme creator? It cites the scriptures as part of the things that denote God, as well as, well, basically everything. So would I say it could be reasonable to say that all things denote there is a God? I guess my answer is that it depends on how God is being defined. For instance, if the God being argued for is claimed to have created the world in seven days in a literal fashion, then there are plenty Plenty of signs that show that God does not exist. So evolution would not denote God in an instance like that. The problem of teleological evil would also seem to denote a God that not only is indifferent to suffering, but kind of enjoys it. Which kind of shows that God is not all loving, 
or all compassionate, and so forth and so on. Whether all things denote God depends on the God in question. Of course, we could take all of our experiences and data and then build a God around it. We could paint a picture of God using what we see. Using all that we know about the world, we could create a concept of God that matches it all. So in this way, we could say that all things denote God. However, if we do this, then it seems that we are simply presupposing God exists, and then fitting all of our data into this picture of God. The version that God created would, in a sense, be based on bias. Rather than deducing that God exists based on the data and our experiences, we would be filtering our data and experiences through this bias that God must exist. It also means that if there are any great revolutions in our understanding, then all things may no longer denote the existence of God, and that picture of God would have to be updated. Are you sure that we could 100% say that there is no intelligence that created the universe? This is a pretty simple one to answer. No, I don't think we have enough knowledge, data, or information to say without a doubt there is no intelligence that created the universe. I would even go so far as to say that even if we had this knowledge, data, or information that showed we could say there is no intelligence that created the universe, we should remain open to the idea that some new piece of information may come up in the future that shows we are wrong. Having 100% certainty on anything leads to the stifling of inquiry. Being sure that you cannot be wrong leads to dogmatic thinking and the inability to correct bad thinking and bad conclusions. Both of these things are things that all good skeptics should be doing their best to avoid. Is it possible that there are beings in the sixth dimension or higher which would be gods compared to us? You probably don't even need to add in something like in the sixth dimension or higher in order to imagine beings that would be gods compared to us. Just consider Arthur C. Clarke's third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If we imagine someone from 4,000 years ago brought forward to this time, they would surely see much of the world's technology as the equivalent of magic. Being able to speak to someone across the world in real time through a piece of plastic that transmits through what appears to be nothing, that would look like magic. It would look like the work of gods to them, as would so much more of our technology. Now, consider a civilization far ahead of our own. Think of something like the technology we see in Star Trek The Next Generation. Imagine a being that suddenly appeared in front of us thanks to the technology of a teleporter. That being then makes someone in our group disappear thanks to that very same technology. The person in our group is then taken into a technology like the holodeck and they experience the most amazing things. We can also add in something like the parable of the feeding of 5,000 here as well especially when it comes to the replicator technology in Star Trek The Next Generation. Imagine those beings using the replicator and transporter technology to feed a whole village. Those beings most definitely would appear to be gods to that village. Then imagine that those beings want to be considered as gods. Any sufficiently devious enough group of people could quite easily achieve that goal using that technology. Then, when questioned about things they cannot do, they could simply respond in the same way that the Bible or even the verse mentioned earlier from the Book of Mormon does. They could simply respond with, You dare to question the gods when we have already provided sufficient evidence? It seems to me that technology would suffice for any group of beings to appear to be gods. With that level of technology, needed being relative to the level of technology available to the race they were trying to fool. Would it be reasonable to assume that by some Darwinian evolution a species could evolve into what could be identified as gods? So this seems to be a slightly different question to the last one. This one appears to be asking if we could evolve biologically into something that could be identified as gods. And on that note, I'm not so sure. We could certainly appear to be gods in the sense of the answer I gave to the previous question. Could we evolve in a biological sense though? 
Well, that one seems kind of unlikely. Based on my admittedly limited understanding of the universe, evolution, and human biology, it seems very unlikely that we could ever evolve the ability to transport across space without the use of technology. Nor will we ever be able to make objects such as food appear out of thin air without the use of technology. From what I can tell, the universe and biology simply do not work in that manner. Could I be wrong? Well, sure. But you have a mountain to climb before you can show that to be possible, at least beyond imagine if style statements. What is it about the Homo sapiens that we have evolved the way we have into being so technologically advanced compared to other species? I'm not entirely sure. I'm not an evolutionary biologist, and my understanding of evolution is limited compared to someone like that. My best answer to this could only be something like selection pressure. You're probably better off asking someone who has studied evolution in far greater detail than I have. Could it be possible that the conscious, like basic matter itself, can neither be destroyed into nothing nor created from nothing? This question as it is written doesn't quite match up to the question as it was spoken, so instead I'll go with the question as it was spoken, as that one makes a little more sense to me. It also seems more in line with some of the other questions, which leads me to believe that what is meant here is the conscious or consciousness rather than conscience. I could be wrong, of course, and if I am, I apologize for answering the wrong question. Going with the idea of consciousness instead, I would say the answer to this question is no at least based on how I see consciousness anyway. Consciousness is something that emerges from sufficiently complex brains. It's the result of brain states and mental processing. It's not a substance in and of itself in the way that a substance dualist might posit it. So I think once the brain ceases to work, the consciousness along with the memories are destroyed. As with anything though, I could be wrong about this, and my knowledge of neuroscience is nigh on nil. My knowledge of philosophy of mind is limited to what I learned during my undergrad and my masters. Could it be possible that the spirit could be some form of matter? As with the other questions that used verses from the Book of Mormon, what you can see on screen here are the verses that are mentioned. The verses don't really define what is meant by spirit here, but I'm going to hazard a guess that it's something along the lines of a soul. If what is meant here is, could the soul be some form of matter, then my answer is, yeah, kind of. I already believe that the soul of a person is physical, as I believe the soul is simply who we are. It's our likes, our dislikes, our passions, our motivations, and that kind of thing. The soul, at least for me, is simply a metaphorical sense of ourself, which I believe comes from our psychology, which in turn comes from our brain. So, in some sense, I do believe that our soul is made up of matter. I'm not sure that this is what is meant here, though. My thoughts are that what is meant here is a soul in the sense of some separate substance that is us that inhabits our body, much in the same sense that most Christians and Muslims use the term. In that way, I would have to say, if the soul exists, it would make more sense for it to be matter than immaterial. It would certainly solve the interaction problem created by positing an immaterial soul. However, I don't think there is such a substance as the soul, and I would need more of a description and supporting argument in order to give a view of any real substance. If Jean-Paul Sartre is correct when he said, existence precedes essence, how much of an essence would we have if we have always existed by way of having a pre-mortal life? How radically free would we be? So, I think this question seems to be based off of a misunderstanding of what Sartre meant by existence precedes essence. In a quick and easy rundown, what Sartre meant is that who we are is not defined based off of some predetermined essence that created who we are. The self and who we are does not come about because of this mysterious essence that precedes our existence. Instead, who we are comes about after our existence. The essence of who we are comes about based on our experiences and our interactions with the world. We create who we are. 
or our essence based on those experiences and interactions and how we see ourselves. So in this sense, if we had a pre-mortal life and one that has always existed, then existence would not precede essence. Our essence would come from that pre-mortal life. You could perhaps argue here that existence precedes essence in the pre-mortal life if that pre-mortal life was something that happened to come into existence at some point. And therefore, the essence was created in the very beginning of the pre-mortal life. But without memories of that pre-mortal life, it would seem to make no difference to our essence, as it would have no influence on how we see ourselves or our interactions with the world. We would still create ourselves based on our experiences and interactions with the world. If somehow part of who we are is based on unconscious recollections of this pre-mortal life, it would return to the idea of essence precedes existence, making the question malformed. At no point would it ever mean we had extra essence though, at least not in the sense implied by the question. We would always have the same amount of essence, as the essence is simply a metaphorical term. It also would not make a difference to how radically free we are, at least not as I would understand it. Could the doctrine of the pre-mortal life to explain the free agency of man and that we all knew what would happen to us on earth yet chose to come here anyways, the doctrine of salvation for the dead to explain that God gives equal chances to all men and women, and the prospects of a God who weeps be enough to solve the problem of evil? As always, what can be seen on the screen is the verse listed in the question. The way I see it, these ideas that are posited would certainly answer some of the questions put forward. If we consider the idea that we choose to come to Earth knowing what will happen, then we can see it as an answer to the idea of free will and the idea that we did not ask to be put here. The idea of a god that weeps kind of gives a weak answer to the question of indifference to the suffering on Earth. Combining all three of these does not satisfactorily answer the problem of evil, especially when we consider something like teleological evil. It does introduce an interesting question to me though. If existence with God is as amazing as it is often claimed, then why would people choose to come to Earth rather than stay with God? Now, I get the idea that people might want to come to Earth to make it a better place. There are certain elements of this in Buddhist beliefs, but if life with God is a life of eternal bliss and perfect and there is nothing that could beat it, then why would anyone choose to leave it? This seems to me to say that life on earth, even with the prospect of suffering, is better than a life with God. If you found the Book of Mormon to be a real historical document, what would that mean for the Bible? I'm not really sure, as I haven't read the Book of Mormon, and so I don't really know its content. What are your thoughts on Latter-day Saints compared to other Christians or other religions? As with the Book of Mormon, I don't really know a lot about the religion of the Church of Latter-day Saints. I only really know what's passed around the skeptic and the atheist community and the mainstream media. Much of what I see there makes me think of it in the same way as I see other religions. There are some good elements, there are some very foreign elements, and there are some elements I would consider bad. There are also concerns I have as a skeptic that make me see it as entirely man-made, just like I see all other religions. As a religion, it's not something that has ever interested me enough to look into it. In the sense of looking for God, I don't think God can be found in any of the religions that we see among the human race. What I can say is that the Mormons that I have met have tended to be very respectful people, and very decent people. It was a Mormon that used to visit my parents that introduced me to Anne Rice and Interview with a Vampire. But I can only speak for those Mormons I have met that have come into my community in a missionary way and not how Mormons treat each other in their own communities and how they treat those that leave the religion. I understand that I cannot convince you of the possibility of the existence of a literal God such that I believe, but could I perhaps persuade you towards a metaphorical God? So I find this to actually be a really interesting question. It's a question that can be seen in multiple ways. Um, I'll answer a couple of them. Let's first start with the idea of being persuaded towards a metaphorical God. When it comes to God being metaphorical, I already am persuaded. As far as I can see, God already is metaphorical. 
It's a way of explaining the mysteries of the universe and life within it. It's a metaphor for why we should be good and a metaphor to explain suffering and loss and much more of that kind of thing. In all honesty, I kind of wish those that believe God is metaphorical and not literal could convince those that believe God is literal that God is actually metaphorical. Well, I'm not so sure that it would solve all of the problems that religions arguing for a literal God and literalist interpretation of holy text cause. It would at least help to minimize them. Another way to look at the question, of course, is to look at it in the sense of being persuaded to follow a metaphorical God. In that sense, I'd have to say no. That option is already available to me. For example, I could adopt Christianity in a cultural sense. In this way, I could have a guide for judging right and wrong, customs to follow, a group to gain community from, and that kind of thing. However, I just simply don't feel the need to adopt those things from a religion. I don't particularly need a religion for guidance, or a god to help me explain things like suffering, or as some kind of comfort. While I agree that there will be many benefits for many people, it's just not something that I particularly need. Like I say though, I do find this to be an interesting question and I've kind of skimmed through it here because it's something that I'm thinking of addressing in a future video and one that is much longer and will let me help to cover many of the different aspects of this kind of question. So thank you for the question. And so thus ends this Questions for Atheists video. There were definitely some interesting and different questions in there, at least to me anyway. Other skeptics and atheists might not find them quite so interesting, and many will probably see them as the same old questions. It does make a change to see them being asked by someone that is Mormon, and I appreciate that. It's a shame that all these Questions for Atheists videos seem to come from evangelical Christians and Muslims, as other religions tend to come from a different perspective. I guess part of that might be because other religions tend to proselytize less, but still, it would be nice to see more of these from people who are not Christian or Muslim. Thanks for taking the time to watch the video, I most definitely appreciate it, and hopefully I'll see you again soon. Take care.